Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I am Jimmy Evans, and today we have a great, great program for you. I'm joined by a special guest uh, talking about a fascinating subject. Josh Peck works in full-time ministry with Skywatch TV as a documentary filmmaker. He is also the author of numerous best-selling books. Josh is founder of Daily Renegade, where he has a, he's hosted a variety of shows and podcasts, and he's been featured on numerous television and radio shows. And today we're going to be talking about a book that Josh wrote with Tom Horn called Abaddon Ascending. And it, the subtitle here is The Ancient Conspiracy at the Center of CERN's Most Secretive Mission. It says Technology and Bible Prophecy Collide. Josh, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, th this is, uh, and Tom is my dear friend, uh, but you guys did a tremendous amount of research in writing this book. And we appreciate your research very much. Now, we're going to talk, first of all, about just kind of the general uh, science. Now, we're talking about quantum physics, so I don't want the average person out there to go cross-eyed because, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not on that level either. Now, we're going somewhere with this because there's a major international uh, project called CERN. And we're going to talk about that later. But we're going to begin by talking about some of the very, very troubling scientific things that are going on in the world today that the average person really needs to know about. Let me, let me begin by saying, just in the simplest terms, what, what is quantum physics? Yeah, so physics is really just the study of nature, just the study of God's creation. We would, we would put it like that as Christians. Quantum just means the smallest of the small. So whatever the smallest bits of matter, whatever the smallest particles are, uh, that is what quantum physics studies. So um, it's just studying the smallest building blocks of God's creation. We as Christians would, would put it like that. A scientist wouldn't. They would say nature or the universe or something. But uh, in a nutshell, that's what it means. So the field of quantum physics, you know, it, it uh, for the average person, it makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable. But you kind of feel the opposite about that, don't you? Yeah, it really what what it comes from is uh, scientists almost speak in a different language when they talk about quantum physics. And, and really, uh, you, you find this in all areas of, of science. Um, once you kind of get the lingo, though, <laughs> you can you can kind of understand better what they're saying. And you realize that the, the big picture stuff isn't actually that difficult to wrap our he heads around. It's just usually not explained very well. And unfortunately, that's a huge problem in the scientific community. Uh, there are a few physicists that can explain it better for for laymen like you and I uh, and those actually tend to get more popular Michio Kaku is a good example of that he has a way of uh, being able to explain really complex things in a way that people can understand so I, I try to do that in my books as well uh, talk about these you know they, they are mathematically complicated but the big concepts around much of this stuff really anybody can understand and isn't that just like God, just like God to create nature that way <laughs> to make yeah. it where it's beautiful and complex and artistic and creative, but also simple enough where we can at least get our heads around it. Yeah, and, and one of the things that that just bothers me a lot is that there's this concept that there's the Bible and that there's science and that they're against each other. They're antithetical to one another. And I think people are being beaten down today. An example would be evolution being taught in schools. You know, the educators are saying, well, you know, the Bible, that's a bunch of, that's a fairy tale, but here, you know, science is an absolute fact, you know, they can prove evolution, which they cannot. And so talk about observation versus interpretation. Right. So, yeah, science, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that science and religion really were kind of the same thing because um, scientists, you know, a couple hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, they kind of viewed it the way that, you know, I think we as Christians should today, just like I described earlier, we're studying God's creation. And if you if you approach science that way, understanding that this is God's creation and you're looking at it for, you know, appreciation and stuff like that, it kind of takes out some of that natural pride and hubris that we see in science today. And that's because they've removed God from science and right. they, they uh, they're just trying to look at the universe as if it either always was here or it created itself somehow. And they don't really have any good answers for that. But you're right. They they'll they'll say stuff like that, but then they'll talk uh, against the Bible quite a bit. So the difference between observation and interpretation, I think, clears all this up because science and the Bible actually do go hand in hand, which we should expect. Science is just studying God's creation. God also uh, 
wrote the Bible, you know, and inspired yeah. through his, his people. So um, when an observation is made, let, let's, let's take science. When an observation is made, everybody in the room that's, that's observing that, that's seeing that, should be able to objectively agree of wh what's happening. But what does it mean? That's where scientists um, kind of go all over the place. And so, some stay middle of the road, some go way off into left field. We, we even see this with uh, just Christians in the Bible. You know, we can all agree that a Bible verse exists, you know, like John 1.1. 1, 1. We can right. all agree that that exists. But what does that mean? Now, there's a whole bunch of debate about that, you know, um, and, and really any Bible verses like that. So that's the difference between observation, which is just agreeing what the objective reality is, and then interpretation. So the observations, the, the objective reality of, of the Bible, the, the objective truth that it teaches, and the objective um, observations of science really do go hand in hand. What disagrees are the interpretations. So, for example, there was a physicist that I, I was watching one of his lectures, and he, or no, it was actually a debate. He was debating a Christian. And um, this physicist said, well, we know that there can't be an afterlife because there's no quantum field to take the information anywhere. Now, that is like the most ridiculous thing and frankly, not, not a very <laughs> smart thing for a physicist to say because an afterlife and, and th is... Those kinds, of, those kinds of comments are very intimidating yeah. to the average Christian. You know, it sits them down and it's just kind of like, well, I'm going to keep my mouth shut because of, this guy's a scientist here, but go ahead. Yeah, and they'll talk as if it's a pr like a, a, a proven thing. And right. but what the physicist doesn't realize is if there's an afterlife, that's something outside of physical reality. Qu quantum fields are just what reality is made of. It, that, that's all it describes. Just what physical reality, the world, the right. three-dimensional world we live in. Um, it, 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 ju it just describes what how, how it operates, what it, what it's made of. It says nothing about the soul. It says nothing about the afterlife. Nothing about any of that. So saying that quantum field theory disproves an afterlife it really doesn't make any sense but that's how he's interpreting the very right. real science of quantum field theory so the interpretations definitely disagree but then we're just talking about different belief systems so it's not really a problem with science and the bible it's a problem with uh just diff people's different belief systems so really there is no contradiction between science and the bible well another example of that is i saw you know, a lot of the like the anthropology, the paleontology and things that is done, they, they go out and they find a fossil. And I noticed mm -hmm. the, they found a tooth, a single tooth. And from that tooth, they, an artist rendered what that tooth came from. N not a skeleton, yeah. a tooth. And so that was the interpretation. Everybody saw mm -hmm. the tooth. We all agree that's yep. a tooth. But they then interpreted it according to their biases. That's what that's what happens, and so and we have to understand. And that's where I appreciate you being on on the show. We have to understand, not everyone in the scientific community is is an atheist or right. an agnostic or an unbeliever, but most of them are. Mm -hmm. And so secularists control most of the sciences, and they interpret it as such. Now talk about the the slit experiment and how that's a good example of observation versus interpretation. Yeah, this is a great example. So the double slit experiment is a very real experiment. You can even do a, a small version of this at home with just some tin foil and a laser pointer and a couple other things. There's instructions online. It's a really simple experiment, but, uh, but it is strange because science right now isn't there's no consensus on exactly what this means or or why this is happening but the the basic rundown of it is when they shoot electrons uh through that's called the double slit experiment so they shoot elect electrons through these two slits um when there's a detector d to detect the particle the the pattern that comes out on the other end of the two slits looks a certain way uh, but when there's no observer when there's no detector it looks different so the the kind of interpretation the general interpretation is that somehow observing the the particle changes the way that it behaves now this can get all into sort of really wacky new age stuff i mean new age steals from quantum physics all the time and this is this is a big one uh th this has spawned things like you know you can create the reality around you you know right. just picture it in your mind and it'll come into your yeah. you know the name it and claim it kind of stuff too and yeah. uh, a lot of that um but you know even if even if just the fact that it's being observed somehow changes it, this is this is uh, these these are electrons. This is on a, a microscopic like 
subatomic really level. It, it, it would be such a small change that you wouldn't be able to do anything with that in the in the real world. Uh, but but more than that, there's a really there's there's simpler ways to look at this. When you when you have a detector, well you're adding a detector, so you're adding uh, a whole clump of particles, uh, which naturally would interfere with the path of this one electron. So it could be as simple as that. So the observation is that there's a different, there, there's different patterns um, based on whether the particle is observed or not. But the interpretation, why is that happening? Is it because we cr control reality with our thoughts or is it just because we're putting a big clump of particles right next to it? So of course, you know, th those particles have fields and uh, energies and like all, all these different things. Of course, there's going to be some kind of interaction. So uh, it, it, it's more than likely probably that. But again, a lot of scientists, uh, and new agers and stuff they want to take this stuff really far and and push it as far as it can go because it sells books it gets clicks on websites you know pe sure. people get uh, excited about that kind of stuff but uh but there's no reason to to think that we are actually controlling anything at all just in that we you know our bodies are are made up of particles that interact with uh, traveling electrons so it could be yeah. as simple as that so talk about why is quantum physics, what does it have to do with the Bible, and why should Christians, why should Christians care about quantum physics? Well, it's really cool because quantum physics says that everything in reality is essentially energy. But what's interesting is physicists don't know where the energy comes from. Now, we as Christians do. God spoke everything into existence. Right. Um, but this energy is still being sustained from somewhere. And in fact, depending on which physicist you talk to, some physicists will even admit, well, we, we know that, that the energy comes from somewhere, and, and we even know that it can't be from our three-dimensional universe. It's somewhere outside of it. And most physicists, that's as far as they'll go, because that's a little too close to saying that, hey, maybe God exists, you know? Uh, that's right. So, so um, e even just from that standpoint, having a basic understanding of, of quantum physics is, I think, beneficial for the Christian if, if the Christian is important or, or uh, uh, interested in that topic, but also just to disarm against um, uh, deception. Because, again, we have scientists will just flat out lie about what certain experiments mean and what... Absolutely. Um, yeah, and so we we as Christians, you know, like like in that debate I brought up earlier, there there would be a lot of Christians that would hear something like that, and it sounds scientific, you know, the, the quantum field theory says that there can't be an afterlife because there's no quantum field to take the information anywhere. And by the way, quantum fields don't take information anywhere anyway. That's not exactly. I don't know what what that physicist was talking about, but <laughs> when a when a Christian hear hears something like that, it, it can sound kind of convincing, and it's like. Well, now I guess, I guess, you know, I have my faith. I got to throw out all of science now. Well, not necessarily, you know, throw out some of the interpretations that disagree with the Bible, but you can keep, you can keep the science. Quantum field theory is, it's a real thing. It's how the LHC at CERN actually works. But, um, so having just a basic understanding of some of this help, uh, some of this stuff can help us disarm against all the deception that's out there in the scientific community. We're going somewhere, for all of you who are watching, we're going somewhere with this conversation, and we're starting at the beginning by talking about this, because we're going to talk about CERN. And this CERN is a huge project that is going on right now. I believe it's over in Europe, and it's affecting all of the world. It has incredible spiritual implications, prophetic implications. And Josh is going to be explaining that to us. And so we're just kind of taking one step at a time. Dr. Hugh Ross uh, Josh, who is an astrophysicist, he's someone that I that kind of writes in language that I understand, and he received Christ by reading the Bible, and he he started reading all of the holy books around the world of the major religions, and he said scientifically they're all just a bunch of rubbish. There, there first of all, there wasn't anything specifically said that could be proven scientifically. He said then he got to the Bible. And when he started reading the Bible, first of all, there are 12 creation accounts in Genesis 1. And so in other words, Moses, who was not a scientist, Hugh Ross said they're all in the exact order they have to be in. And if they were in any different order, it would disprove the Bible in the first chapter. And the, the chances of Moses getting those right by accident are one in 49 million. And wow. so he starts in Genesis 1 and reads the creation account and he said, as I read through the Bible, I realized this is a scientifically accurate book. 
that makes very specific claims about its scientific accuracy. Job said, and the Psalm says, God stretched out the universe. How did they know that the universe was expanding? All those mm -hmm. kinds of statements like that. And so for, for believers, the reason that, that we're doing this program is to help you to understand, do not be intimidated by all the, the scientific talk of the people out there. And people are saying that the, the Bible is just a, an unscientific book. It, it, there's, no, there's no science behind it. In fact, many people say science disproves the Bible. What do you say about that, Josh? Yeah, that's that's one of their interpretations. They they say that there's physicists out there that are really, really like militantly almost against the Bible. Like Lawrence Krauss is one of them. He he'll even go on podcasts and say that religion offers nobody anything. That the Bible was just written written by uh, goat herders. Which isn't that kind of insulting? I mean, have you tried herding goats? I don't know how to do it. <laughs> you know, why, why would that? Yeah, exactly. Why would that make? Why would that mean that somebody's stupid? Like, uh, but but no. When you read when you read it, I mean, there's actual quantum physics in there. I mean, uh, in the first chapter of Ezekiel, when it talks about these these amazing heavenly beings like uh, d descending in uh, out of this whirlwind. Well, the way that they're described, it's it's almost like these these four beings are kind of fused together in really weird, odd ways. What that actually is, there's there's a scientific principle there called extra dimensional unfolding, and I know that. That sounds like a big word, and scientists do this all the time. They, they, I think part of it is hubris. They, they name things like this so it sounds more complicated than what it is. Right. All it really is is um, imagine there's like a two-dimensional universe that's just flat on your tabletop. Well, if I put a cube down there, how can I show that cube to the two-dimensional being that doesn't have up or down? You know, right. if they looked at it, they would just see a square. Um, well, I could unfold it. And if you unfold a cube, then, you know, you lay it out flat. It actually looks like a cross. Uh, but then they can at least have access to m all of the information of that cube. They won't be able to put it together in their head what it fully looks like. Well, so the, the thought experiment is, that is used to explain how a four-dimensional object could be unfolded into our own three-dimensional universe. So... Right. Uh, a hypercube. If you unfolded it, it actually would look like in our universe, it, we, and we'd be able to see it, it would look like a cross with two extra arms, kind of, uh, wow. made of made of cubes. So, uh, but if you did that again, like if you did that too many times, eventually these parts, like if you tried to unfold it again to show that to a, a two-dimensional being this time, uh, some of those flaps are going to start to overlap, and to the flatlander, to the the two-dimensional being, uh, it would look like those parts were melding together, and that is exactly what Ezekiel describes. And so we're we're seeing something that actually has uh, a scientific name to it. it, it it's uh, it's only a few decades old, yet somehow Ezekiel 2,600 years ago was able to, you know, it, it, it's because he was just describing what he saw. He didn't know anything about yeah. quantum physics, but we can actually uh, show that now, which is which is really phenomenal. So, yeah, it's all over in the Bible. So talk about dark matter uh, from a scientific perspective, but a Christian might interpret it differently. Yeah. So dark matter, basically, it's a word given to really a mystery. So when scientists look at galaxies, they realize there's not enough matter in the galaxies to create enough gravity to keep galaxies together based on how fast they're spinning. Because when you when you spin, so you know, just imagine taking a yo-yo and whipping it around. That the yo-yo at the end, uh, because the centrifugal force stays in orbit around where you're spinning. The galaxies work the same exact way. Uh, but through their measurements, through through math and stuff, they're able to show that these galaxies, all of these galaxies should have already flown apart. They're being held together by something. Uh, and it's something that's creating gravity, and it's something that we can't see, we can't detect, we, we, we have no idea what it is. There's, there's a couple theories out there. One theory is that they could just be, they call them dark particles, basically, but dark matter particles. That they're just uh, loose particles, they don't connect together, but they're spread out all over. Uh, collectively, they have enough gravity, but they don't ever bind, they don't interact with ordinary matter. Um, so that it could be something like that. But I think another really interesting possibility is there, there are theories and, and even mathematical um, equations and stuff to show that gravity, well, first, gravity is one of four 
forces in the universe. And for some reason, it's the weakest one, like by far. The other three are pretty equal, but gravity is really weak for some reason compared to the other three. Uh, you could demonstrate this easily on your desk. You just take a paper clip, put it on your desk, and gravity's holding that down. I'll get, get the weakest kitchen magnet that you have <laughs> and put it on the paper clip, and it's going to overcome the, the force of gravity there. Uh, so scientists have been wondering for a long time, well, why is that? Why is gravity so much weaker? And the, the possibility is that gravitons, um, the way they've been, they've been able to show in math, mathematics, so the graviton hasn't been discovered officially yet, but they know that it exists because there's a gravitational field, and uh, the field is what produces the particle. So if there's a gravity field, there's a graviton. But what they've been able to show through math is that if higher dimensions do exist, if there is a fourth dimension of space somewhere, uh, gravitons would have the unique ability to actually bleed into these other universes, and possibly that's why uh, gravity is so much weaker than the other forces. Well, if that's true, the opposite would be true as well. If there's four-dimensional or higher-dimensional matter out there in the universe, the gravity from that would affect our universe too. So I, I write about the possibility, in Abaddon, Abaddon Ascending, I write about the possibility, what if what's holding these uh, galaxies together, what's holding the universe together, is just the surrounding spiritual creation that, that God put in place. Yeah. And maybe that's what scientists are calling extra dimensions when really they're talking about heaven or, you know, the, 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 just the spiritual reality that God created. So it could be that those very real constructs, those heavenly constructs, could be affecting gravity all throughout the universe. And maybe that's what's actually holding uh, galaxies together. So th no way to prove it, but it's a really interesting th uh, thing to think about. Well, it's interesting that science can't tap into it, you know, and th yeah. that in itself shows you there is it's not of a scientific value or scientific nature, not not science as we know it. Talk about the rainbow gravity theory and why that's dangerous oh. for Christians. Yeah, yeah. So um, a few years ago, there was a theory put out and these kind of things happen all the time. So rainbow gravity theory is a good example of a common trend. The trend is basically science will come out with a theory and say, if this is true, then it disproves this certain thing about God. I mean, they're like obsessed with the Bible with how much they hate it. <laughs> but um, so specifically with rainbow gravity theory, the only thing that it says, and I picked this one because to me it was the most ridiculous. The only thing that the theory actually says is that gravity just affects different wavelengths of light differently. So not a big deal. Gravity would be a little stronger for like a red wavelength than maybe a blue or green, you know. So they call it rainbow gravity. The idea is if if you saw light go into a black hole because it it because gravity operates differently on different wavelengths, you would actually see a rainbow. Um, so, okay, kind of cool thought. But then somehow, and, the, and I've never gotten a good explanation of this, somehow they said that if that is true, then it means that the universe could not have been created by God, and there, there can't be a God, there can't be a point of creation. And I, and I don't know how they reached that, how they bridged that gap, but somehow they did. So I wrote about it in the book, and I said, you know, first, keep your eye on rainbow gravity theory, because that that... That second part is just the interpretation. It, it would not mean that. All it would mean is exactly what the theory says, that gravity uh, operates differently on different wavelengths. I don't know why that would have to mean that the universe is infinitely old, or there's no God, or there's no time, or whatever they were trying to say with it. Uh, but they do this. They do this a lot. So I haven't heard anything about it in the past few years. I, I, I'm imagining that that theory probably died, but uh, but who knows? It's something to keep an eye out for. But the the main the main thing is that that's just one example of a larger problem. Um, every couple of months, there's going to be a new article coming out, you know, oh, yeah. where some scientists is saying, okay, here's a theory, and if this is true, it proves there can't be a God. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's, in a nutshell, that's rainbow gravity theory. Um, if it, but if it does turn out to be true, I mean, imagine that. There could be a day where, you know, a Christian gets up, turns on the news, and the news reporter is saying, well, scientists have proven rainbow gravity theory, and we have, we now know that uh, there is no God. <laughs> and yeah. we wouldn't know that, but hearing that on the news could be really jarring for a Christian, and then the Christian would say, well, i got to just throw out science altogether. Science is saying there's no God, so science can't be real. So, no, that's yeah. not exactly what's happening. It's the interpretation that uh, they're putting on the experiment or the discovery or the mathematical theorem or whatever. It's just the interpretation that clashes. So that's that exactly. that whole thing about God not existing, that would be an interpretation of something that may be like a real natural phenomenon. Well. 
going back to the theory of evolution, it's a theory. Yeah. It cannot be. It cannot be observed. It cannot be replicated. But now I do a teaching on this. Uh, but Charles Darwin doubted evolution. There's a book yeah. that thick called Darwin's Doubts. And one of the things that caused him to doubt evolution was the human eye. The mm -hmm. human eye is incredibly sophisticated. And in his book, Origin of Species, he talks about it. He said, I agree, it's absurd to believe that the human eye could come from chance. Okay. Then he goes, he explains it away. But what Charles Darwin didn't know is every cell in our body has a four billion letter long coded sequence. It's, yep. a, it's a code. And if there's a code, there had to be someone that writes that code. There's no such thing as a computer code without a computer programmer. Okay. And so he, but he didn't know about the human DNA. I, I do not believe he would have ever published Origin of Species had he known about DNA. The other thing is the theory of relativity equals mc squared. Einstein proved that time and space are created dimensions. Okay. Yeah. In other words, there has to be a creator. Yep. And so the, all of this nonsense, you've done such a great job of explaining all these things. And what we want to do then, by the, this, is, this is the prep for the next show that's going to be a barn burner. We're talking about CERN. But what we're trying to do to Christians out there is stop believing lies from the scientific community when they say, when they're trying to disprove the Bible and have confidence in your God and in your Bible that they're true. They cannot be disproven and the nature itself proves. So anything else you want to say, Josh, before we close this program? Uh, yeah, just uh, there There are some really good scientists out there who are Christians. I can suggest uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer is excellent. Uh, he, he's really great. Um, Michael Strauss is really good, too. He actually works at CERN. He's a Christian. I uh, actually just had him over not that long ago to interview him for a, a film that we just put out called Ragnarok. Um, so there are like good scientific sources out there where you can uh, actually learn quite a bit and they and they put it in in ways that you can understand. So it's it's uh, th th there, there's a lot of good out there in the scientific community. We just need to know where to look. Great. So what is your website where people can go to find out more about you? Sure. Uh, if they want to get the book, skywatchtvstore.com is the best place to go. And then my uh, personal website is dailyrenegade.com. And we'd love to we'd love to have you all over there. Great. Well, I, you need to look. Josh up and his website there, Abaddon Ascending. Now on the next show, Josh is going to join me. Now we're talking about CERN. You've got to hear this stuff. It's absolutely mind boggling what is happening there. Josh, thank you for joining me. I'll see you again on the next show. Sounds good. Thank you. God bless you. Goodbye. If you're watching us now on YouTube, uh, I want you to become a subscriber. We have endtimes.com and we have a whole podcast that's going to follow. The rest of the podcast is going to follow this interview uh, with Josh. I'm talking about uh, items in the news related to Israel and Iran. I'm also answering questions from our subscribers. And so if you're not a subscriber to endtimes.com, go to endtimes.com. It's $7 a month, $77 a year. We would love to have you be a subscriber. And if you are a subscriber, you cannot watch the full version here on YouTube. You need to go to endtimes.com to watch the full version. God bless you. Stay tuned.